Chapter 22. Commissions of Inquiry. Before we took our place among the free countries of the world, there was the matter of the Cocoa Purchasing Company to be cleared up, for I insisted that my party should enter upon independence with a clean sheet and that it should be publicly absolved of the allegations that were being levelled against it. When I first began my countrywide political organising in 1948, I had been surprised and concerned to discover the number of cocoa farmers who had become so indebted to foreign-owned cocoa-buying firms and African middlemen and brokers that their farms had become confiscated. Those farmers were constantly appealing to me to do something about this, but at that time it was not so easy. Most of the retail trade, as well as industrial enterprises of the country, were in the hands of non-Africans, a state of affairs which had arisen first on account of lack of adequate capital on the part of the Africans, and second, because of the absence of training facilities for Africans to become really successful businessmen. It is true that the various mercantile firms of the country had for years recruited young Africans, some of whom rendered a very valuable service to their employers, but neither the training they received nor the money they earned was sufficient to equip them for private enterprise. There was no doubt in my mind that if capital were available, a number of Africans would quickly gain the necessary experience to be able to manage fairly large business concerns. But I realised, too, that it was not easy for Africans themselves to raise loans from the banks because of the lack, in most cases, of adequate security or suitable guarantors, and that if relief from indebtedness was to be brought about and the African was to be encouraged to manage his own affairs, the problem would have to be tackled by the government itself. I was not alone in recognising this unwholesome state of affairs in the country for several reports, issued from time to time by various commissions referred to the question of the indebtedness of farmers in this country. Professor Shepherd, in a report which he made as early as 1938, recommended strongly the establishment of an organisation of farmers, both for the marketing of cocoa and for the issuing of loans to meet the indebtedness of farmers. Under Gold Coast conditions, however, it seemed clear to me that such loans would have to be would have to be issued through organisations rather than direct to farmers, for in this country it is generally difficult to secure title to property which would be acceptable as a basis for granting loans. If loans were given through organisations, I felt that such organisations, having some control over their members, would be better equipped to ensure redemption of loans than those who made loans direct to individual farmers. With this in view, the Cocoa Purchasing Company was set up as a subsidiary of the Cocoa Marketing Board. Within a year of the formation of the Cocoa Purchasing Company, thousands of farms had been redeemed by the original owners and within three years this company had become the primary local cocoa buying agent in the country, and this in face of severe competition from foreign firms long established in the cocoa trade in the Gold Coast. Before long, however, rumours began to spread concerning the company. In 1953, the then chairman of the Cocoa Marketing Board made a report to the board, pointing out some irregularities in the CPC. When I received a copy of this report, I discussed it with the central committee of my party, and I also referred the matter to the minister responsible for the broad policy of the Cocoa Marketing Board. When this board appeared to do nothing to implement the report of its chairman, however, I decided that it was necessary for me to see what influence I could exert on the Cocoa Purchasing Company, that's the CPC, through the Cocoa Marketing Board, to put its house in order. I could not stand by and watch something I had created and which had flourished so rapidly suddenly wither away through the machinations of people who sought its destruction. 
Towards the end of 1955, I ordered an inquiry by the police into the affairs of the company. After this, petition after petition began to flow into Government House for onward transmission to the Secretary of State for the Colonies, asking for a commission of inquiry to be set up to investigate the affairs of the CPC. The government, through the police, tried to prove the truth of these allegations in order that they could be brought before the court, but there was no evidence on which to initiate criminal proceedings against anyone in authority. Eventually, I appointed a committee of two to investigate the affairs of the company and later, on the advice of the chairman of the committee, the cabinet decided to appoint a commission of inquiry, for in this way witnesses could be examined on oath. The report of the commission, issued at the end of August 1956, proposed among other things that the cocoa purchasing company should be reconstituted and that it should be run by a board of directors composed of three members nominated by the opposition, three members nominated by the government, and a chairman nominated by the governor. This was in fact the only recommendation of the commission, which the government was unable to accept. As the appointment of a board on this basis would weaken materially the power of the government over the board and render the government powerless to carry out satisfactorily even the limited direct, direct responsibilities it has under the ordinance. In its findings, the Commission alleged that the Cocoa Purchasing Company was controlled by the Convention People's Company, basing such allegation mainly on the fact that the affairs of the Cocoa Purchasing Company were discussed at the Central Committee of my party. It seemed to me that it was perfectly in order for party members to discuss a matter with which they were being publicly associated at the Central Committee meetings of their party. It was also stated by the Commission that the government knew all about the shortcomings of the Cocoa Purchasing Company, but in spite of this, they took no steps to rectify them. They had overlooked the fact that it was I, as Prime Minister, who ordered an inquiry to be made into the affairs of the CPC by the police, and also that it was the government who appointed the Commission of Inquiry. Time and time again, government spokesmen, both in the assembly and outside, have stated that reports of any changes of ir any charges, sorry, of irregularities in the cocoa purchasing company should be made to the police. For so far as criminal proceedings were concerned, this was a matter entirely for the attorney general, over whom my government had no jurisdiction. The main cause of the shortcomings in the conduct of the Cocoa Purchasing Company reported upon by the Commission is the absence of a sufficiently effective control over statutory authorities by either the Assembly or by the Government. The proper constitutional position is for the Government of the day to accept ultimate political responsibility for the disposal of public funds and for the conduct of statutory authorities which are entrusted with such funds. In the light of the report, I not only propose changes in the organisation and administration of the Cocoa Purchasing Company, but also decided to review the position of all statutory boards and corporations, my purpose being to increase the degree of public accountability of all statutory boards. The report of this commission put me in mind of a previous inquiry in December 1953, when an attempt was made to discredit me and the government by allegations of bribery and corruption. I was not blind to the existence or the possibility of bribery and corruption in the country among both Europeans and Africans. Things had moved fast, the feeling of power was a new thing, the desire to possess cars, houses and other commodities that were regarded as necessities by the European population in the country was not unnatural in people who were suddenly made to feel that they were being prepared to take over from those Europeans, and money, the wherewithal to obtain these luxuries, was tempting. In any event, this inquiry centred around Mr. J. A. Brimer, who was at that time my Minister of Communications and Works. The story that he told was that an Amer Armenian 
contractor had promised to give him £2,000 as a gift after the contract for a training college in the Northern Territories, which had been awarded to him, had been signed. According to Mr. Brimer's statement, he eventually accepted this gift, which was made to him in instalments of £500 in £1 notes on four occasions. Brimer said that he had for some months past heard stories of bribery and corruption and had suddenly realised that by accepting these brown paper parcels of pound notes he was committing a serious offence. In due course, the Commission of Inquiry found him guilty of accepting the £2,000. Under the Gold Coast Constitution, the responsibility for prosecutions rested entirely with the Attorney General. Mr. Brimer was not prosecuted. The Commissioner was in no doubt that the contractor had given Mr. Brimer the sum of £2,000 for the purpose of influencing him to use his position in his favour. This man was tried on charges of corruption and convicted, but successfully appealed. It seemed to me that behind this case was a clear attempt to implicate me. When the Commission of Inquiry began its work, I was busy preparing for the forthcoming election and was campaigning in Togoland. One morning, my attention was drawn to a report of the proceedings in the daily newspaper, in which it was stated that Brimer, in a statement to the Commission, had mentioned my name in connection with rumours of bribes. I was completely taken back, and issued a denial at once which was published in the same newspaper. When I returned to Accra, however, I decided that the allegations made against me were too serious to be dismissed by a mere denial in the daily paper. I therefore appeared before the commission and was completely exonerated. To quote from their official report, allegations were made in respect of acceptance of bribes or improper conduct by the Prime Minister in connection with four government contracts. In each of these cases, we find that there was no justification for the allegation. Such were the findings of the commission, but to me the whole thing went far deeper. It was my view that Brimer was only the dupe, and I was quite convinced that the affair was a calculated attempt to bring my government into disrepute by suggesting that bribery and corruption were rife among those in power.